All right, let me take a deep breath and get going. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we are using Zoom for this meeting, which allows for the public to participate in the meeting as an attendee. The chair can request that members of the public provide their names for purposes of keeping accurate minutes of the meeting. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order they, have, they were raised. All questions should be directed through the chair. As a preliminary matter, this is Chantal Boyce Murphy, uh, Director of Culture and Tourism. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Uh, Mary Malavis? Here. Liz Holland? Here. Garrison Beal? Here. Sarah Boyce? Here. Matthew Peel? Here. Thank you. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. David Sharp? Here. And Chantal Blois Murphy is here. Anticipated speakers on the agenda, please respond in the affirmative. Marina Disbonnet? Here. How'd I do with that? I just wonder. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, so good morning, um, everyone. The open meeting of the Visitor Services Advisory Committee is being conducted remotely pursuant to Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting will feature public comment. However, I do not see any members of the public present. Um, for this meeting, the Visitor Services Advisory Committee is convening by video conference via Zoom app as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you and to take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda unless the chair notes otherwise. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to co cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. The chair will, the chair will introduce each uh, speaker on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until uh, your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that generates accurate minutes. For any responses, um, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in a conversation with other members, please do so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment to those members of the public that have joined the meeting via Zoom. Members of the public who wish to speak must state their names and, if not, and be acknowledged by and speak through the chair. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by roll call vote. And um, uh, David, please let the um, minutes show that Niles Parker uh, also joined the meeting. Hi, Niles, good morning. Good morning. And Madam Chair, I yield the floor to you. All right. Thank you, Shanta. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, December 12th meeting of the Visitor Services Advisory Committee. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the November 14th minutes that were circulated with the agendas and posted on the town website. Are there any corrections to the minutes? All right, seeing none, may I have a motion to approve as written? Approve. Second. Second. Second, Sarah. Thank you very much. By roll call, I will uh, ask for an approval of the minutes. Liz Holland. Approved. Yes. Garrison. Approved. Sarah. Approved. Matt. Approved. And Niles. Approved. And the chair votes in the affirmative as well. Please note that the minutes were approved uh, and unanimous consent. Okay, moving on to our third item on the agenda. Welcome, Marina. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, for those of you who do not know Marina, she is with the town in the events coordinator, huge job. We welcome you to be here with us and have a discussion. I think what we would hope to gain is any insight of news or upcoming events or things that we should be aware of. Uh, for next year, maybe a little comment on this past season. And also just to let you know that Visitor Services is obviously here with um, Chantal and David and the whole Department of Culture and Tourism team to support you in any way. I know Chantal works very closely with you on 
a lot of events and things that go on. So welcome, Marina. I, uh, you have the floor. Um, good morning, everyone. And Mary, thank you so much for introduction. Uh, you saved me some time. Uh, so my position <laughs> uh, with the town of Nantucket is events and film permitting coordinator. Um, so we review different um, permits for different events, public events and private events, or any type of events that might affect uh, safety, public safety. And we also review applications for different film permits. So we don't have a lot of film permitting requests. Usually uh, every year we probably permit five or six um, film permits and it's usually just one major film production and other film permits it's just like a small permit that usually don't really impact um, businesses or don't impact public uh, the process uh, of event permitting usually starts with event um, special event application uh, right now, we have only one type of application. It's a special event application, and it's all-inclusive application. So if applicant needs one day per pouring permit, beer, wine, or alcohol, or they need one day entertainment, or if it's a beach event, or if it's a special event application for sport events, they start with the same application. So that one type of application covers different areas that uh, applicants need to think during their uh, planning process. So we have questions about um, food. So we, it's like, so I look at our, this position and this application, we're like a gatekeeper. So we start, this applicants start with us and then we review. And if we see some concerns with that application, we would direct uh, people to different departments. So for example, we look at the location. Okay, is that the venue we never issued event permits before? So we, we can start working with fire department if they have any concerns, if that location is safe to have 100 people or we can reach out to the building department and see if they have any concerns about occupancy numbers and make sure that a location is safe for different type events. If it's location that has been used in the past and if we don't have any concerns, it's, it's okay to move forward. Then we have a food section. So we see if there is a new food vendor that hasn't been licensed on the island or if it's somebody who comes from off island they would have to work closely with the health department to make sure they obtain all the proper permits or if it's a multiple food vendors health department has regulation if it's more than two food vendors every food uh, food vendor has to submit temporary food permit application even if they all license, they all already have food service establishment license or the cater license. But once it's more than two at the same event, they need to get additional applications. If it's outdoor event, we ask applicants to submit um, emergency action plan. That's actually something new that has been created only a um, couple years ago. Uh, I believe uh, Janet Chalty worked closely with our old fire chief and they decided that something we have to start doing because that has been hasn't been done before uh, for the indoor locations they should have emergency plan for that venue already um, we also have some questions about like street blockings uh, if somebody wants to block sidewalks or street um, they will have a link on our application and they can work closely with other departments and then there are questions about tents if it's a tent which is bigger than four square feet they would have to work with building department so what we're trying to do we're trying to incorporate incorporate all those additional permits or from different departments that applicants need to work on in our special event application and so people can start uh, reviewing the application and can see all the gu guidelines that they come from different departments so now if we review uh, the 2023 year and how many events we had. So I want to say we issued closer to uh, 300 permits. Um, it covers different events. It would cover beach events uh, open to the public at Jerry's Beach or Children's Beach. It would also cover strictly private events that take place on the town-owned properties such as Mayakamit Beach or um fisherman's beach it's usually 
catering companies would apply for the permit uh, to run their catering events on the public beaches, and which is considered commercial activity, and commercial activity has to be permitted per our beach regulations. Um, we also have a lot of requests from different galleries for their art openings and art receptions. They usually apply for one day um, pouring beer and wine uh, permit during the summer for their different opening receptions. Um, and our restriction is kind of, we advise them not to have more than three hours. Two hours is perfect once they, uh, to limit that event and just also make sure when they set up bars, they have tip certified bartenders and their bars don't block entrances and exits. And um, it, like in the past, we had a couple galleries requesting DJ. Uh, so when they ask to have a DJ at the gallery, uh, that becomes kind of an issue because um, they would have to have uh, inspection, pre-event inspection with the fire department. And once we get into entertainment and specifically DJ and dancing, there are different requirements that come from the fire department. Once they hit 100 people, I believe there is also requirements to have crowd managers on site. Um, also, we have sometimes retail stores request um, uh, pouring permits for their sip and shop events. And what we introduced a couple years ago, right now, retail stores are technically limited only, uh, um, they can have one event per year. And it has to be just some kind of a special event, whether it's a grand opening or something like business after hours with a chamber or like a special event anniversary. So one day print permit hasn't been incorporated just to for all these retail stores just to have sip and shop every Friday. It has been an issue like five years ago. And plus we have already over close to 100 or maybe already over than 100 uh, licensed uh, locations with annual or seasonal uh, liquor licenses. So out of those 300 events, I want to say most of those events, it's just the annual events. They happen every year. It's just different, uh, sometimes different time of year. Um, and we don't really get a lot of new requests for like public assembly events. Public assembly event, it would be event uh, which expect to have more than 250 people. Under our um, bylaw and regulations, if you expect to have more than 250 people, you have to go through public um, assembly permitting, which would require to have a special um, meeting with select board, where select board would have to review and approve. So anytime you want to plan 250 or more event, and if it's... Um, not a licensed venue, uh, like for example, VFW, it's already a licensed venue and they already have um, ability to host more than 250 people. So it's technically, we look at the location. Or anytime there is a significant change, you would have to go through the select board. As an example, it could be a uh, road race as a firecracker. Years ago, they had a different route. It, they would start at the um, on the Young's Way and um, go through the Rotary and Monomoy. So that was a lot of huge impact on the traffic. So they had to be relocated to a different location. So now Firecracker has been relocated to the Jetties. They start at the Jetties Beach and they have it on the 4th of July. And they just do Brand Point Circle um, Monument Group run and then back to the Jetties. So from public safety standpoint, that location worked much better. There is less um, traffic congestion and it's just better for everyone. Uh, what else? Um, so we don't really open our event permitting process and application for like 2024 year until January. What we do right now, we have all this like annual events that happen every year. Uh, for example, at Jetty's Beach, like Swim Across America, uh, annual Sand Castle, uh, Boston Pops, or Triathlon. What they do is they just reach out to us and say, this is a date we're planning to have, just save the date. We will mark it on calendar so we don't have any conflicts in the future. And then we can start working on the permitting process uh, later, like um, just in the spring. Um, what has been, ha like also what has been happening recently, uh, some organizations and some 
event, they will start selling tickets or advertising event uh, without even submitting special event application, which we usually do not encourage to have any press releases to sell any tickets unless you went through the initial like point and like you can submit special event application we can tell you right away if we have any concerns what needs to be done to move forward and after that you can while you're working on all the permitting requirements you can do some kind of a press release and start selling tickets usually we don't have any concerns with like annual events but sometimes like new event we would just want to work out an event permit first before they start selling tickets um, that's pretty much it. Any questions? Yes, Liz. Liz, you're me. Oh, there yeah, you go. No, that took me a little bit. Um, thank you so much for coming, Marina. It's it's interesting to hear about this whole faction of um you know, what goes on in Nantucket and everything that people have to go through to have these events. Um, I was just curious about weddings. I'm assuming weddings would be also part of the permitting process, especially if you have uh, large numbers, are they? So with weddings, um, we usually get involved if it's um, if it's an event venue without um annual or seasonal liquor license uh, and if uh, people rent out that location specifically for events uh, we would work with applicant and they would have to go through one day pouring permit or since wedding is strictly private event uh, they can just hire 12 c cater 12 c cater it's a cater that already has specific liquor license through the state and that license gives them permission to sell alcohol at specifically private events for no more than five hours. So right now in Ireland, we have about uh, three or four caterers with that uh, liquor license and they can use that license at all the private events. What they need to do by state law, they just need to send us a notification at least 40 hours before the event, how many people they have in and uh, where they will be serving and just like the hours. So we have this form and it's just, they have to notify police department and police chief. So before, during the COVID, there was the whole issue, how many people were allowed to be at event venue and how many people can be at the private, uh, at private property. So there was the whole issue. And obviously people wanted to have more people at private homes and they start telling us like, oh, it's not really a private home. It's been rented for the event. It's a, it's event venue. So can we have more people? That's when we got involved into permitting uh, for private homes. But we're trying to stay away from private homes as long as it's um, in line with our like bylaws and regulations in line with like noise by law and no longer than um, no later than 10 p.m. or it's like you know tents no more than three events per year for that private home and they talk to all the neighbors uh, so they don't have any noise concerns so we usually don't really get involved with private homes unless it's a advertised event if it's a fundraising event for nonprofit and they selling tickets and they're advertising an event and inviting public to that private private home they would have to go through the special event permitting they would have to apply for one day entertainment permit for one day pouring permit because even if it's private event they sell tickets and advertise event so it's that's the difference. If it's a strictly private event, wedding, birthday party, rehearsal, dinner, there will be different regulations. Okay. I was just curious because I was just wondering about, um, you know, the whole wedding um, concept on Nantucket. And we, of course, we know September is a huge wedding month and brings a lot of visitors to the island. Um, but I was wondering how much was actually happening during the summer. And it sounds like that wouldn't... Uh, what you do doesn't really tag into that, um, you know, especially if we end up with uh, short term rental, um, you know, shutdown or, you know, some sort of, um, you know, getting a handle on how many short term rentals we have that may, in fact, affect the wedding 
uh, season, you know, July and August. And I was just curious how many weddings are actually in those months um, now, you know, um, and it would certainly affect the number of visitors coming to the island. Um, it's it's probably hard to say how many weddings we have because uh, it's either a private home or if it's like a licensed venue. So if it's some kind of a licensed restaurant, when people just uh, book the restaurant, we're not going to even know about it because it's licensed locations are already allowed to have private parties, private events. So we don't really get any notification. For like private homes and um, like different non-licensed locations, we kind of can have an idea how many weddings they have based on uh, permits submitted for the tents. Most of those uh, weddings would require tents and th that's something we can go through in our system and work with building department and we can have an idea okay, this is how many tented events we have. Uh, but we were not, not going to be able to incorporate uh, like licensed venues, like, you know, the biggest uh, event venues like we, um, White Elephant or the Galley Beach. But I also want to mention some of those licensed venues, they have restrictions. They have restrictions how many events they can have. As example, Jetty's Beach Sandbar, uh, there is restrictions on tents in July and August, and they can not really have private events in July and August besides those events open to the public or ticketed events that we already have written in agreements such as with, uh, Boston Pops, Opera House Cup, and Swim Cross America. So they have they can have additional events uh, like weddings, but it, it has to be June, uh, September, October, and May. Same for Galley Beach as well. They have uh, conditions on their entertainment license and I believe on a liquor license about events and entertainment amplified entertainment so it's like so it's not an issue for their neighbors so it's usually i believe they're not allowed to have it in july and august it's just june and then they go september october same for summer house so i believe most of the licensed venues have restrictions for july and august so that's kind of that's why they pushing all those weddings to happen either in early season or later in season mm -hmm. thank you yeah, Marina, I have a quick question. Is there on a licensed venue um, a limit to the number of days a tent can be uh, erected in the course of a year? I thought there used to be way back that you could only have a tent for so many days, not necessarily function. Has that changed? Um, uh, so as, as I remember in our like bylaw for like, uh, private residences it's no more than three or nine days three events or nine days that's for private homes uh for commercial venues um they can apply and have permission to have the tent up for longer than uh 30 days so like okay. you can see the tent like at cisco brewery it's a licensed location so they have specific waivers through the plus or something because they have the tent up for i want to say for the whole year and so same it's just as, a matter of, of yeah, applying so, then. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, they would have to work with the plus and there is specific waivers. Uh, or I think they changed something. It used to be they had to go through ZBA. Now I believe it's uh, probably a slightly different process. Thank you. All right. And Sarah? Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, Marina. This was really interesting and helpful. And I'm and I'm especially happy to hear about the for the outdoor events, the emergency plan that needs to be in place. Um, I just wanted to get your perception on like how did the year go? Do you have a lot of events that you find out about that are in violation or just like in a general feeling of how it's going? And then kind of part of that, I'm curious about what the enforcement is. So just interested to hear about that. Um, so I don't believe we had a lot of uh, violations with events. I want to say this year we only had maybe two or three events that start selling tickets without or going through the process. We would just reach out and they would jump on special event application right away. Uh, enforcement, it's a, it's a different part. So technically, uh, we do have enforcement for licensed locations, for annually seasonally licensed venues, if they don't have like tip certified bartenders 
actively sell alcohol to someone who is under age of 21, we have it written in our regulations. What they what can be their penalty? Like they can be closed for like one day or for two days, like next year during the busiest time. So they know what not to do next time. But it's different with events. So it's technically uh, we don't really have uh, enforcement for events. So we would just have to reach out and explain the rules. Or if we have advertisement, some kind of a retail store pouring alcohol, we would advise them this is something that is not allowed by the state law. You would have to go through the process. You need to submit application. Uh, but we don't have really uh, like a penalty set up. Or you cannot really close a retail store because they only have one day pouring permit. So it doesn't make any sense. So there are violations for like liquor licenses, but uh, not so many for events we can just work close if uh, i cannot speak about like fire department or other departments like health department they have their penalty if somebody is trying to sell food at the event and they didn't apply for specific temporary food permit their fine can be up to five five times the cost of that permit uh and they can enforce it they have health uh, they have health inspectors so i believe uh my licensing supervisor and baxter she was trying to work on getting like a licensing inspector, someone who can inspect events and licensed venues and as well like rental agencies and all those, like a car rental agencies. Uh, Marina, I have a quick question too. Um, Sarah, are you finished? Yeah, okay. Um, if say, a, just an example, say an art gallery has an opening, you know, to feature a local artist for, you know, two hours on a Friday night. Um, they obviously would need a one day pouring license from you, make sure there's a tip certified person there, which can be one of their employees, correct? Yes. Yes. That's correct. Tip certification is pretty yeah. rough. Now, if they want to serve some sort of food, does that have to be with a licensed caterer or can they bring in food from a commercial establishment? Just curious. Uh, they can bring uh, food, they can do it themselves, they can go to stop and shop, buy food and put together cheese platters, they would just have to apply for one day temporary food permit through the health department. And health department has been kind of supportive if it's a um, nonprofit. If like, as you know, we have a couple galleries that are nonprofit, they can submit mm -hmm. one application and it will cover up to five events. Okay. So light and it's, it will cost less. So they either go with a licensed uh cater, licensed food service establishment, or they do it themselves, it, they would just have to apply for the temporary food permit. Okay. Yeah, I just I just asked because historically there, for years, there used to be a Friday night gallery of events throughout, um, you know, the island, different events would have, you know, walking tours and whatever. And, you know, so yeah. that makes sense. So uh, for years, like Amy Baxter, she was trying um, to work with Chamber and create something like a gallery walk. So we mm -hmm. have like one Friday every month in the summer, we have all the galleries on board and they do gallery wa walk and we will work with galleries. We probably will have like, uh, you know, like uh, different um, fee for this permit. Uh, so we didn't get anywhere so like uh some yeah. galleries thought it was a great idea let's have it some galleries were mm -hmm. like oh no two hours is not enough if every gallery is gonna have two hours uh we need at least 45 minutes with a member of the public so they can enjoy the art and see everything so uh so we didn't get support from some of the galleries and some galleries sometimes get upset and call us how come that galleries have an art opening on the same night uh, as we do, we started months ago and they submitted application only this week. I was like, uh, we, we cannot control which day gallery can select for their yeah. art opening. Yeah, I know the Garden Clubs had Art with Bloom, which was not, you know, a, a catered event or anything. It was just they worked with galleries to create flower arrangements that mirrored art. And it was open for a weekend. You know, so anyone could just stroll through during their normal business hours and um, just to get activity in the galleries, especially when the 
people weren't buying art during economic downturns. But uh, yeah, we need to support our artists. So anyone else have any questions for Marina? Well, you're, you, I want to thank you for being here. Obviously, I know you and Shanta and, and David work very closely together on uh, events because David's always seems to have something going on in Children's Beach, um, which is great in the summer for our visitors. Um, if there's any time that you think we might be able to assist, um, obviously this, this group is here, especially Shanta and David, to help you. Um, I appreciate you coming in and giving us your time today. Um, you're more than welcome to stay on for the rest of our meeting, but you don't have to. Um, and is there any, any other questions for Marina? Okay, if not, I want to thank you for being here. And um, it thank was very so informative. Yes. Thank you. I'll stay. <laughs> okay, thanks, Marina. Okay, moving along. Let's see, where's my agenda? Okay. Next item, director's report. John Todd, take it away. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so just a quick run through of um, numbers from November. And I pulled just the unique visitors uh, to kind of uh, take out the, the day trippers, uh, not the day trippers, the, the workers out of the numbers and us who live here traveling. So we had about 26,800 unique visitors from November 1st to the 30th, which is 4.4% less than um, last year. Thursday seems to be the busiest day of the week uh, throughout November with a time between uh, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. And Brotherhood was the number one visited uh, location on the island throughout November. Most people traveled to the island uh, via Logan and the High Line, following very closely behind by about 500 less, which kind of blew my mind. Um, and then for stroll week, and I pulled those numbers, even though um, it would fall into December for January report, but I figured you guys would want to know how many people are actually here over the weekend. Um, so I pulled the numbers from Thursday, uh, November 30th, which seemed to be the, uh, the date that a lot of folks were starting to arrive. And um, I wanted to see when they would get a full view of the weekend. So I pulled for um, till Monday when they were leaving. Um, so we had about 21,900 unique visitors to the island over stroll weekend, from, so Thursday to Monday. Uh, it's 5.8% more than we had last year and 71.9% more than we had two years ago. Uh, the busiest yeah. day obviously was Saturday um, with 17,100 um, 17, people um, visiting the island on Saturday. And their busiest time was between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. And the top five visited places were uh, Straight Wharf Restaurant, the Highline Ticket Office on Straight Wharf, uh, Brotherhood of Thieves, Nantucket Hotel, and the Club Car. And the uh, top uh, ways they got here was through the Highline, the Steamship following closely behind, uh, Logan, C Street, I was um, pleasantly surprised to see them on the list, and uh, Westchester Airport. So that's, that's what I have for um, visitor trek to the island. Um, one of the things that the Culture and Tourism Office is working on um, for to hopefully launch by next month, wish me luck, um, I'm going through the training process right now, is uh, becoming a passport acceptance um, office for the town because we don't currently have one. It was previously through the Health and Human Services. And unfortunately, the person that was um, uh, licensed by the Department of State to do it retired and we had just haven't been able to get anyone else um, hired or interested in in taking on that role and now that I'm in day two of the training I see why <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm hoping to you know to get through that by the end of next week and um, get it up and running for to kick off next year for the visitor services office to start accepting passports. Because um, it's a lot for people to travel, especially people with kids getting their passports for the first time to have to make appointments to go off island. And if you're lucky, you'll get an appointment at the Hyannis, um, um, what's it called, post office, which is where we trek. So um, that's, that's kind of the, the big thing we're working on right now. That's a passport office. That's exciting. Um, I know it's been a long time since we've had someone on the island that was able to, um, you know, 
help, especially first time. Renewals are pretty easy, but first time passports can, can require a lot of paperwork. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a question about last month when you commented on the Pacer AI, which I have to tell you, I honestly don't understand any of this stuff, how it how you get all these numbers. I think it's sort of magical. Um, but you know, someday you can give us all a class because I, I I find it fascinating. But one of the questions from you know the minutes of last month, which I didn't have time to ask was, um, and I mentioned it to David earlier, native shoes, which we know is a busy store, seem to have the most number of people in November. Can that be because of the High Line? Be or or how, how are these, you know, I mean, High Line, is, they're standing in line and, you know, five feet from the door. Can, can that be part of it? Or is it physically crossing a threshold? I don't understand it. So it's physically crossing a threshold, if you will. Okay. So we set it up. Um, let's say we put the, the little pin on the map in the middle of their store. So okay. they actually have to physically go into the store. And then we... Um, the distance outside of that little little pin is so small that it's it, it eliminates the folks standing in the line outside. So that raises the other question uh, that a lot of people don't go into the steamship office anymore mm -hmm. because everything's on their phone and they just, you know, get out of a vehicle or taxi or whatever and go into the shed and wait for the, the high speed. So is there such a case as dropping pins in two different locations for a business? I'm just, so there again, I need education. Because of that very reason, instead of dropping the, just relying on that little pin, we actually, um we create a border around okay. the location so that we get the that entire space. Okay, say that's education. Thank you <laughs> very much. You're, you're helping us understand this new technology. Yeah, that's a great All question. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Shanta, anything else? Um, nothing uh, Matt, the... Matt, did you have a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I just got a question. I just wanted to see if you guys heard anything back from Stroll and just any feedback, how everything went. Because um, I, I spent some time downtown because my son was working the Cub Scouts, uh, the popcorn. <laughs> uh, and he's a scout, so he was down there helping out with that. So I spent a couple hours down there with him uh, doing that. And just kind of some observations that I saw. Mainly, I mean, everything, I think, went fairly well this year, you know. There wasn't tons of you know, drunk people stumbling all over the place. And <laughs> maybe later on that night, but uh, as far as, you know, the first mid-morning and everything, it was it seemed pretty fun. You know, there was tons, a lot of people out. Um, turned out to be a pretty decent day, too. Um, but as I, I, for some reason, I feel like I remember porta potties downtown in the Stopping Shop parking lot last year. And uh, didn't see any this year. Maybe I'm remembering wrong or something, or maybe it was a different event or something. But that was kind of the biggest thing I saw was kind of lack of bathrooms for all of the shopping kind of down there. Because um, everybody kind of hits, like they'll hit the Stop and Shop park a lot. And then Stop and Shop uh, actually shut their bathrooms down um, after a while, too. And so people were trying to go over to like Nerda or other places and, and kind of scrambling all around to find bathrooms. So I don't know if anybody talks to the Chantal, if you talk to the chamber or anything like that at all, it's mm. something to kind of think about maybe for next year as far as them just having some porter potties in that stop and shop uh, bathroom. Because and then you go down to the straight wharfs and the boat basin bathrooms and there's just a line of, you know, 20, 30 people down there as well. So we um, had our um, we, we had our internal recap meeting and then. Um, we had our meeting with the chamber as well yesterday to go over all of this. And one of the things was discussing porta potties. They've never been required as um, far as my memory goes uh, to have porta potties down there. And they certainly didn't have any last year um, or the years before that um, when I was over at the chamber. But we did talk about it for going forward that it might be, it might, it, it, it will be a requirement um, for them to have porta potties. Yeah. And um, they'll, we'll work with them to figure out where the best locations for those are. Yeah, because we we recognize that you know the stop and shop parking lot might be a little tough, but there were a lot of bathroom issues over stroll weekend. I think that was that was the number one thing trying to get the bathrooms cleaned and working with the with the cleaners to make sure they were staying on schedule and bathrooms that were backed up that were previously expected to be public restrooms available that had to be shut down. Bathrooms who were supposed to be open that 
decided they weren't going to be open to the public that day, which is against the law. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so there are a lot of bathroom issues that I'm working through right now um, yeah. for to make sure it doesn't happen again. Last time, but that's a great observation. Yeah. 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 Other than that, I thought it was I thought it went pretty yeah. well. So yeah. Sarah, did you have a comment or question? Yeah, just real quick, kind of piggybacking on on Matt's comments. Um, I was gonna say I was downtown also, tons of people, everybody was happy and not the stumbling drunk people that I've seen at 10 in the morning <laughs> on Stroll before. Um, my two comments, and this is basically for the chamber, but just to you know, kind of get it out in our notes here. One was the bathrooms. Um, I don't know, just Shanta for future reference, the boat basin bathrooms, some of them were closed. And so people were like actually waiting in line and then realized that they were locked and closed. So I don't know like what, who decides when the boat basin bathrooms are decided to be closed. But like, I know a lot of people that were the, the wharf where um, Yoshi's is was like insane because now they have two restaurants and People like didn't have anywhere to go to the bathroom. Anyway, that's that's one note. The other thing that I heard a lot is I know, you know, like my son also was a scout forever and was downtown in previous years. So the that area of Stop and Shop, it used to be called the nonprofit marketplace and it was mainly for nonprofits and selling items and food and things. And now it has become stores from off island. So there's a, many different businesses that have the word Nantucket in their name that aren't from Nantucket like they don't ever they're not on Nantucket except for stroll and I heard from many people that it kind of rubbed people the wrong way um and so I I was just curious about the evolution of that and if there's a way to you know encourage more nonprofits to come back to that or I don't know just it was more of a note it was it was a little bit the, the other thing is that there it used to be that you couldn't have a a little stall downtown if you already have a store and there's many stores that have like or a couple that had booths downtown or in the stop and shop area as well as a storefront and so I just didn't want to take away from groups like the Boy Scouts um, the skating club or like some of the other groups that had booths and then they're competing with like places from Greenwich Connecticut who decide to make a bunch of money that day so I don't know I just that was more of a note to kind of took away from the Nantucket feel um, in some of those areas. Not the scouts. We love the scouts. <laughs> no, that's a great observation um, and, and comment. I know that they still offer a nonprofit rate. So it's cheaper for nonprofits to participate in, in the marketplace still. And, and they get the same um, information. So it's, it's really on them to register for the marketplace and man it. As for um, the vendors that are in the market, it's available to all chamber members. And they can't say, you know, simply because you're not uh, a Nantucket business, you can't you can't sell in the market. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are I'll definitely bring it back to the chamber and share those um, observations with them. I can't guarantee that anything will come of it though. So, <laughs> but I could, yeah, that would rub me the wrong way too. So. Yeah, I know. All right, any other questions for Shanta? Okay. All right, moving along. Final item on the agenda is Visitor Services Coordinator's Report. David? Okay, so um, I submitted to you the um, stats for uh, November as well as Christmas Stroll, and uh, the numbers are pretty uh, um, straightforward. Um, we had about the same amount of people came through the office in November, and um, also, um, I had the numbers for stroll for, for this year and last year um, coming through the office in the four days, and we had more people this year than last year. Um, so now that uh, stroll is over, uh, we are down to um, being open five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday, um, nine to five. Um, and one of the things that I've been doing is putting together the annual tour of lights uh, map that uh, just was posted on the website yesterday and um, is available here to take. Um, and so it is this, uh, it's like a fold up thing with uh, the map in it. 
And then um, on the back is an ex extended, um, you know, um, ramp point thing because uh, we had, a, I, I can't put it all on the same page the way it's designed, but it's here for you guys to take as well as online. And um, so, uh, you know, I've had a number of people asking about it this year. And, we've, and so now that strolls over, it's this is uh, available for you to have until about um, um, uh, New Year's. So um, I don't have any other things to share at this point, but I'd uh, be happy to take any questions. Matt. Yeah. Are, are we still doing the, uh, or is the town still doing the, the contest where they pay the electric bill for whoever has the best lights display like they <laughs> used to? No, uh, this is because uh, we're just doing it as as a kindness to everybody to you know have them have a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. I just wasn't sure if the town was still had that because I, I no. wasn't in a thing at one point where the town like whoever had the best lights display. There, there was a contest for that for a while, but it got kind of dicey with you know people getting upset that they didn't win or something like that. So it's just now a straightforward, you know, go enjoy the the tour and and have fun. Yeah, there there used to be teams that would go around and vote on them in cars. Yeah, I drive yes. them around. Yes, that that <laughs> ended a few years ago. I think I was in that last group, uh, but it was a fun night driving around the island looking at all the lights. Yeah. All right. Anything else for David? Okay. Um, Moving along, I think there's nothing else for this meeting. Um, next meeting would be January 9th. Um, I'm assuming yeah. we will still yep, do in the winter. Um, I don't know if we have any suggested speakers then. I haven't talked to anybody yet, but we can see if there's any other suggestions. Questions. I know we had a list uh, in later, earlier in the fall, but I'll work with um, Chantan and David to see if we have anything. All right. Any comments from any committee members? Okay. Hearing none. Can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Thanks, Matt. Second. Second. Thanks, Niles. Okay, we don't need a roll call for this. Thank you all for being here. Motion is accepted. Uh, have a wonderful holiday season, everyone, and we'll see you next year. You Thank too. You. Thanks, Thanks Shanta.